So let's get into our, um, our series here. And, and we've been following the story of King David. And really the teaching for the whole year has been under the theme of more like Jesus. And, and so I think it's important for us to follow the story of King David because he is described in the, of Israel. There was already a king, King Saul, but his heart had turned from God. And because David had a heart after God, God chose him, even though David was not qualified by the way the world would look at it. He, he wasn't even noticed by his own father. There was a prophet sent to anoint the next king of Israel, and he knew it was going to be um, one of Jesse's sons. And when Jesse brought out his sons, he didn't even bring out David because he didn't even consider him worthy of it. And so even though his own father didn't consider him worthy, and the world may not have considered him worthy, God looked beyond that. God doesn't look at the things we look at. He looks at our heart. And then in week two, we had Norma preach last week, and she did an amazing job. And she talked about that, that famous story that we all know from Sunday school of David versus Goliath and, and that we have giants in our lives that we have to face, but sometimes those giants are obvious and they're big and other times they're sleeping giants. They're things that we just don't want to stir up or we know need to be dealt with, but we don't want to confront or awaken. And she talked about when we have God with us, God is the one who, who takes care of those giants for us and helps us overcome. And then... Uh, you know, this week, um, the next part of David's story in his life, it's, I'll be honest with you, it's not as exciting as David versus Goliath at all. You know, it feels like this big battle, and then the next part doesn't have those epic stakes. But I think there's something really important here. And, and, and that topic is, is godly friendships and relationships and what those should look like in our life. For you see, part of David's success was that he had a deeply devoted friend. And this friend was named Jonathan. You see, I believe one of the very best ways to develop a heart like David's, a heart that chases after God, is that you need to have a friend or friends who are passionate in their own pursuit of God. The people around you truly matter. Now, I remember as a, as a teen, my youth pastor is telling me, look at your life, look at your friends. If you, if you show me your five closest friends, I can show you the direction of your life right now. And I remember having to look at my friends and say, ooh, I don't want to go in that direction. And I had to make a choice for a time to kind of separate from that and get different friends. But you know, it really matters who's around you. God made us to do life together. And we live in a time right now where anxiety and depression is through the roof. And, and I think a large contributor to us, to that, is that research shows that now more than ever, we are struggling with loneliness and isolation. People are at, at historic levels of feeling lonely and isolated. And that's crazy to me. Because historically, there used to be a time where if you had a family member that lived across the world, you had to write them a letter by quill pen, and you had to have that delivered overseas by a wooden ship, and just pray it got there. And you may never even know. You may never get a response. And yet, in today's world, when we have so much technology, so many means of access and connection, we feel more lonely and more isolated now than ever. And I think the problem is, is that really and truly relationships have to be built face to face. There's something about when you are talking to somebody, when you're across from somebody, the way people's souls can connect and understand each other. It's so different. Any of you that are grandparents in here, you know something that for my kids, um, my, my, fam, my parents moved to Florida like 13 years ago. And so my daughters are six and two. And most of how they know my, my parents is from FaceTime, from video screen. But I know like, and, and my parents are doing everything to move back here. <laughs> and the reason for that and I know if any of you grandparents are in that situation and you're having to video your, your grandkids, when you actually get to see them in person, it's a whole different thing. 
That screen connection can't ever replace face-to-face connection. And I think in a large way, we have kind of replaced face-to-face connection for an artificial means of connection, one where our souls really can't connect. And so no wonder we feel isolated and we feel lonely because we have fallen for a false version of what connection and relationship is. And there's nothing that can replace having an authentic, close, real, godly friendship. I don't think there's a better setup for our souls to prosper. You see, I think we should have relationships in our lives that look like that paralyzed man in Scripture, that he couldn't get to Jesus, so he had four friends that picked him up, and they cut through the roof, and they brought him to the feet of Jesus. That's the type of friends we have. But sometimes we've got to assess whether our friends are like that. Are they bringing us close to Jesus, or do they bring us further away from him? And I'm telling you today, just in a real way, that I wouldn't have the relationship with Jesus that I have today if it wasn't for the fact that I was blessed with people that, that, that were trying to follow Jesus and bring me there and bring me along. Not that I have a perfect relationship with the Lord, because I don't. But sometimes I, I shudder to think where I'd be if I didn't have that influence in my life. And the Bible says that iron sharpens iron, so it's pretty clear that one of the primary reasons Jesus made all this wasn't just so we come to a service. It was so that we would connect to one another. Hey, give the person next to you a high five real quick. And if you're alone in the row, I'm going to give you a high five. There you go. There you go. Okay. Everybody get a high five? No? Did everybody get one? Did anyone miss out? All right, cool. Was well, that we need each other. This isn't just like a movie theater where you come to your showtime, 9 or 11, and you see your thing and you leave. It's not what it is. David, to become who God called him to be, he needed a Jonathan. And we all need that person, that person that we can count on, that we can rely on, that is there for us, that helps us be more like Jesus. So again, we're coming off this big chapter in 1 Samuel chapter 17 where David has slayed the giant Goliath, and and he strikes him down with his sling, and then he pulls out his sword, which Sunday school kind of ignores most of the time, and he chops off Goliath's head, and he picks up that head, and he shows it to the enemy army, and that army flees, and they surrender, and then David takes that sword, and he brings it to the king of Israel, King Saul, And, and And I want you to see, here, King Saul recognizes David not just as a little shepherd boy, but as a mighty warrior for God. And in 1 Samuel chapter 18, starting in verse 1, it says, After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. So just real quick, back in chapter 16, we learn that Saul has been experiencing some kind of, the Bible says distress. So we don't know if that's anxiety, if it's fear, it's worry, whatever it is. How many of you know, or or like me, where sometimes when you're stressed out, you just got to jam out, right? You get in the car, you turn on your tunes. It depends on what I'm stressed out about. It could be anything. It could be John Mayer. It could be Metallica. It, it could be, it could be old, it could be escape the fate, you know, it could be whatever is, whatever is, you know, but then ultimately it's like, I, I, sometime after I get my aggression out, it's like, okay, now I got to put on, I got to do Hillsong, I got to do, you know, I got to do my worship thing, but, um, <laughs> but how many of you do that? Anybody do that or am I just alone and I'm isolated? Okay, well, we're all there. Cool. So, you know, I think he's like doing that. Like Saul is stressed out. He's anxious, and so he hires a harpist to come and play. And David happens to be a very skilled harpist. That's why I made the argument a couple weeks ago. If David was alive today, he'd be like total electric guitar shredder. He'd be like Van Halen. It would be awesome. But instead, he plays a harp. I wonder if he's traded that for a guitar like today, now, in heaven. When I get there in heaven, I'd like to jam with him one day. I think that would be really cool. If I'm really getting off track, and it has really very little to do with the sermon (laughs) <laughs> but David is hired to play 
harp for King Saul. And it's in this context that he meets Saul's oldest son, Jonathan, and they become friends. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 18, verses 3 and 4, And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing, gave it to David, along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. So here, Jonathan really shows us what it means to be a godly friend. And today, I think in these stories, we always like to see ourselves as David, slaying the giant. We want to see ourselves as Moses, parting the sea. We want to see ourselves as Peter, stepping out of the boat. But I think today, I don't want us to see ourselves as David, and that we're looking for a Jonathan, I want us to see ourselves as a Jonathan that could be looking for a David to encourage and lift up. Because I think ultimately that's our role, is to build into other people, to believe into other people, and so um, and learn to be a godly friend and support. So let's pray. Dear Lord, speak to us today. Lord, we just ask for your revelation, and we surrender it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. My message today is called A Godly Friend. You know, in the, in, in the relationship between David and Jonathan, I want to focus on four ways that we can be a godly friend so that we can build relationships that honor the Lord and allow his will to be done, not just in our lives, but in the lives of our friends and the people around us. And so the first thing is this. Number one, a godly friend shares sacrificially. To be a godly friend means that we're going to sacrifice that we're going to give. The, the first story we have of David and Jonathan in Scripture, Jonathan shares his blessings sacrificially with David. And it's crazy because David and Jonathan, really, if you actually, I think sometimes we just read the story and we don't actually think about the story. If you think about it, David and Jonathan have nothing in common. They don't. They, are there two people that could be less alike than David and Jonathan? David is the youngest brother of his father's, Jesse's seven sons. David grew up in the obscure hills of Bethlehem, alone with just sheep for friends. You have to imagine David's skin is dark from working long days in the sun, and that he's, that he's, uh, he's been running around sometimes with his brothers, probably being picked on and fighting the occasional lion. He spends his days caring for his sheep, fighting for them, and, and in down moments, he plays his harp, and he pours his heart out to God. And then there's Jonathan, who grew up in the palace, in the lap of luxury. He's the prince of Israel, and he has every resource. He's a son of privilege. He's an inheritor of power and to form the bond that they did. But I think that's the beautiful thing about church. Because really, if we didn't have God as our common bond in this room, we could find so many excuses for us to never gather together. In the world, this group of people around you, with the different cultures, different political opinions, different ideologies, different skin colors, all those things would divide us and separate us. But because we have the common bond of the Lord, we can come together across any sort of divide the world might have and call each other brother and sister. Amen? Isn't that a beautiful thing? That's one of the greatest things that, that, that God has done with his church is that he has brought this people together across, what does he say, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. That's what the church looks like. That's the beautiful thing about the church. And I think David and Jonathan show us that. These people that really shouldn't have anything in common. They really have every reason to hate each other. You know, one of the oldest warfare tactics is to divide and to conquer, right? That's basic military strategy, divide and conquer. Why do you think it is our world is just becoming so much more divided. It's because that's the enemy's tactic. If we can divide us from each other, 
He even likes to bring division into the church. Well, then he can win the battle. Now, ultimately, we know he won't win the war. But we have been, and I think we see in the story of David and Jonathan, that we have been called to find unity. And, 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 and I want to talk about that. So just to recap, remember King Saul, he's the first anointed king of Israel. Israel's been wanting a king, and they finally get it in Saul. And Saul has all the outward things that you think of a king. He's tall, he's strong, he's probably got a sick beard, like he's got it all. He's, he's Saul, he looks like Judah, is that what you said? <laughs> and so God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint the next king And the reason he does this is because Saul has all the outward and he has none of the inward. He doesn't have the heart. And so God looks at the heart. So he sends this prophet Samuel to anoint the next king. And and Samuel doesn't anoint Jonathan. Now, Jonathan's the rightful heir. How many of you know, any of you that have studied history and kings and kingdoms and how that works, the firstborn son is the heir to the throne. So Jonathan's grown up with the expectation that one day when his pops kicks the bucket, he will take the throne. But Samuel anoints David, this shepherd boy, a man after God's heart to be the next ruler of Israel. And King Saul's not happy about this. In fact, Saul will repeatedly try to kill David to keep David from the throne. And he's not just trying to keep him from his throne. He's trying to keep him from Jonathan's throne. He's trying to keep him from, you know, kings love their lineage and their history and their connections. He wants to establish his throne. And after David slays the giant, Jonathan removes the signs of his royalty. It says that he removes his robe and his belt and his sword and his bow. And he sacrificially gives them to David. What does he take off? He takes off the signs of his royalty, of his position, of a prince who should be king. And he lays them before David. And it strikes me for all their differences that there could have been something that maybe united them. You have to think, In some of those days that David was out in those hills of Bethlehem alone, that he must have felt overlooked. In fact, his own father overlooked him. In fact, overlook isn't even the right word because his dad didn't think of him at all. It was Samuel who said, wait, don't you have another son? He was, oh, yeah, yeah, David, but he's... And you got to think Jonathan had every right in this moment to feel overlooked by God. That, wait, isn't this my throne? Isn't this what I've been raised and brought up to be and to do? He is the heir to the throne. By right, it's his. So really, Jonathan should hate David, is what I'm saying. I mean, how many of you would like to work, and I'm sorry if I'm preaching anybody's pain, would like to work somewhere for years and years and do your best and learn and grow. And then the position you've been wanting to, to get opens up. And then they don't even look at you. And they just hire some random kid and bring him in. You're going to hate that person, right? You probably will leave. Or you'll work in bitterness. You think about Jonathan, he's grown up in the palace. He's grown up and no resource has been spared. He's a prince of Israel. He's got the best teachers, the best school, like education. He's got the best of everything. He's been groomed to be king. And here's what I love is that Jonathan has every right to want to help his father take the life of David and secure his throne. But he chooses something different. Jonathan, the Bible says, loves David as his own soul. And he swears friendship and loyalty to him even unto death. And even though David is taking Jonathan's throne. Of course, like I said, we always want to put ourselves in these stories. 
And that's helpful. And, and in ways, we're looking at that angle today. But we also must remember that all of these stories, they, they foreshadow or they echo things about who Jesus will be and what he will do. And David foreshadows of a lot of what Jesus will be like. But in this story, it's Jonathan that foreshadows Christ. In order to save David's life, Jonathan had to lay down his life. In order for David to approach the throne and be a crown bearer, Jonathan had to leave his throne and surrender his crown. In order for Christ to save us, he had to leave his throne, surrender his position next to God the Father, and lay down his life so that we could be lifted up and approach the throne. And Jonathan did this because I believe he had a God-anointed love for David. But I think really this story is so that we could see how much God loves us. Because it's a love that makes no sense. It's, it's, it's a covenant on Jonathan's end that makes no sense. It's a loyalty on Jonathan's end that, that for David to be king, someone had to make a sacrifice. And for you and I to be crown bearers, the Bible says that you and I are royalty because of the sacrifice of Christ. For you to be a prince and princess to the king of kings, a sacrifice had to be made. A king had to lay down his life as a ransom for your life. The reality is, is that godly relationships are different than worldly ones. Godly relationships are built on sharing freely and sacrificially with one another. That's what it looks like. The Bible tells us that Jonathan loved David as his own soul. He loved, him, he loved David as he loved himself. And the Bible mentions it twice. And, and it got me, when I, when I read that earlier this week, it got me thinking, where have I heard that before? Well, hundreds of years later in the New Testament, in Matthew 22, somebody would ask Jesus, hey, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus would say, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there are two central things. This is fundamentally what it means to be a Christian. Is I love God with all my soul, my heart, my mind, my strength, and I love others as myself. And when I saw that, I realized, like I said, everything foreshadows Christ. Everything echoes. This commandment is demonstrated to us by the personality in the lives of David and Jonathan. David is a worshiper who is a man after God's own heart. He is a man who loves God with all his heart, mind, and soul. And Jonathan loves David as he loves himself. So we see in the friendship of David and Jonathan, this greatest commandment that Jesus gives us echoed and demonstrated. Philippians 2, 5 through 7, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God. It means Jesus was God. Jesus has every authority, every resource. In fact, the Bible says that Jesus could have spared himself from the cross, that he could have called a whole legion of angels to come and rescue him. But he said he didn't consider his divinity, his equality with God, something to be used to his, for his advantage. Any of you ever seen that movie? Uh, what is it, Bruce Almighty? Remember, he gets the powers of God and he's using it all for himself, right? That's what we would do. Jesus didn't use it for his advantage. So whose advantage did he use it for? Yours. Say mine. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Jonathan makes himself nothing by removing his robe and his sword and his belt 
in his bow. Being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. We've been called to sacrificial relationships towards one another. You know, so much in our world, we get so bitter when, if we're honest, we get so bitter and upset when people close to us achieve something. And we look at our own life and say, well, that never happened for me, or I wanted that. But to be a godly friend is that we celebrate and we lift others up, even to the lowering of ourselves. Number two, a godly friend shares a mission. I believe one reason why Jonathan and David hit it off so quickly is they both share the same goal and values. Jonathan and David, they're both both interested in defeating the Philistines. Each of them wanted to glorify the God of Israel. And each of them have their stories of famous courage that they displayed. And all of us, how many of you, raise your hand if you haven't heard the story of David and Goliath. Everybody? How many of you have heard the story of Jonathan versus the Philistines? Just a few, right? Way before David was on the scene, in 1 Samuel chapter 14, Jonathan goes out with just his armor bearer. Now, an armor bearer, the armor was really heavy back then, so they would have someone carry it for them till they got to the battle, and then that person would put the armor on the warrior, and the warrior would go and fight. Jonathan goes alone and confronts a garrison of Philistines, and he attacks and kills 20 of them by himself, And he demonstrates the same courage, the same trust, and the same faith in the God of Israel that David would versus Goliath. This daring exploit underscores Jonathan's role. He's a warrior too. He he is good with the sword he has. He's qualified. And, and, And David and Jonathan share the same common bond of being willing to do what it is God calls them to do. They have the common bond that they desire to live for God, whatever it looks like. And there are a lot of things in life we can bond over. You know, it said some of the greatest bonds in life are when when soldiers are in warfare together and those bonds that they create run deep. But I believe very truly that the best relationships are formed that, that those form best when you are doing ministry with somebody else. Man, I miss, to be honest with you, I miss the days of being on worship, being the worship leader and getting to hang out with the team and do all those things. Because when you're, when you're doing ministry together and you're serving together, you know, when you're sitting on the floor with another adult and there's two-year-olds crawling all over you, and you're doing everything you can to just feed them some fishy crackers and tell them about God. That's a special bond that forms because you're bonding over something that is far greater than yourself. Something that has far more meaning. Something that will outlast you. You see, the beautiful thing about serving God is that, you know, any investment you make in this world, no matter how good the return or how big the return You might make an investment in this life that gives you a return that will bless generations for you. But guess what? It'll run out. Any investment in this world will run out except for an investment made in the kingdom of God because kingdom, God's throne, unlike David's throne or Saul's throne, the throne of God is eternal. It is everlasting. It never goes away. That's the beautiful thing about serving in ministry together. That's really the gift of serving together, is that you are doing something that is far beyond and far bigger than yourself. That's one of the greatest gifts of serving, I believe, is the friendships you get while doing it. Friendships that go beyond what the world could offer. And number three, a godly friend shares authentically. Now, we're going to go forward in the story a little bit. Basically, what has happened is, Saul has repeatedly tried to kill David. And it gets to a point where now David is just totally in danger. And so if he's going to live, he has to flee and go live off on his own. And in 1 Samuel 20, 
after Saul has tried to kill David again, David and Jonathan arrange to meet before he goes. It says in verse 41, As soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the stone heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. They kissed one another, wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. You ever, um, you ever ugly cry? You know what I mean? You ever done that? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, like that. It's just good this illustration. <laughs> you know that kind of cry? You don't want anybody to see you making that kind of cry, right? You know what I'm talking about. That's when you're in like stretchy pants. Your hair is crazy. You look at yourself. You ever do that thing where you're crying so ugly you look at yourself in the mirror? Like, who is this person? <laughs> That's what David's doing here. He is ugly crying. And uh, because of King Saul, Jonathan and David can never hang out again. And for car- clarity, and when we read it, it's a normal cultural construct that men would, would kiss each other. In fact, Paul will say in the Bible a lot, when we gather as church, greet each other with a holy kiss. Now, if you notice... When I greet you every Sunday, I don't say, okay, hey, give out some hugs, give each other some holy kisses. Because in our culture, that'd be, we- that'd be weird, right? We wouldn't do that. It wasn't weird in that culture. But I, but I think my point in telling you that is that if, if, if you look up this passage, what you're going to find is people are going to say that David and Jonathan's friendship was romantic. That's, that's what they're going to say. And I think the reason that, that, that we need to kind of talk about this is because the language of the Bible doesn't bear that idea out. The, the, the language of the Bible makes it very clear that they're friends. See, the, the danger to me is, is, is one, one, it, one is this. The Bible's very clear about how people feel. It never hides how people feel, and it never hides how people sin, <laughs> The Bible will always tell, it'll tell us later on in the Bible what David will do. If you have, any of you know Dor- David's story, there's a, a really rough moment in it. A moment where he has such lust for a woman in his heart that he arranges to take her to his bed and ha- have her husband killed. That, that's what David will do. The Bible doesn't hide things like that. So if there was something, the Bible would say it. But also, I think the reason people search for that in, in the Scripture is because we have this basic idea that, that emotion and authenticity with another person will always really lead to romance or attraction in that way. That's what the world emphasizes, that the way we actually connect with people is through that, right? Right? That's what our culture teaches us. That's what connection is. I think it's a large problem in our world. That shared emotion is always about romance. And so we're uncomfortable with, ro- with, with, with emotion in our society. We're, we're uncomfortable being real. You know, a lot of us, when we come to church, we feel like I got to put my church clothes. That's why I always plan to dress worse than everybody who comes to church. Because that way, that way you feel good about yourself. Hey, you look good, man. Love you, man. But, you know, we, we, we have all these weird things about our emotions. I can prove it to you. You ever, you ever seen someone come up and share something, maybe at a funeral or whatever, and they start to cry? And what do they always do? Well, I don't mean to get emotional, or I'm sorry. They keep apologizing, and I'm like, you had a loss. Of course you're crying. It's normal. But we're uncomfortable with emotion, and think part of that is because our world teaches us that when we share emotions with each other, the destination is romantic involvement. But one thing we see about Jesus is that he always shares his heart with people. 
Do you remember when Jesus wept over his friend Lazarus? I don't think he was like, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get emotional, guys. No, he cried, and it sounds to me like it was an ugly cry. When our world thinks that the only way you can get close to another person is to have some sort of romantic relationship, they totally miss the point of what God has created in the church, relationally with others. I think that when the church displays true friendship, that the world's going to look at that and say, that's different. In fact, the Bible says that. It says they will know us by our love. And what will be different about our love? Well, that love The word there in the original language is agape, which is God's love, which is a love that needs no return. See, a lot of times we love based on what we're going to get in return. But God's love, by definition, it just loves. It just gives. It doesn't need a return. You know, you can be real here at Crosspoint. Just be yourself. I don't care if you come in your pajamas. It doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter if you come like the prodigal son, covered in the mess of the pigs and the mess ups of your life and your mistakes. You can be real here, and I'll be real with you. You don't have to come in here with a church mask, pretend everything's okay. You don't have to talk about how blessed you feel when you're actually feeling worried and upset on the inside. You don't have to come in here in a season of doubting and pretend like you've got it all figured out. You can be real. God's called you to be real. Maybe one of the realest people in the Bible is David, after all. If you ever read the Psalms, he is so emotionally unstable. Read the Psalms. It'll make you feel better about yourself. (laughs) Number four, a godly friend is loyal. Godly friends are loyal to one another. The roots are deeper than these. You know, it's not a disposable relationship. And again, I don't want to preach anybody's pain, but some of us have had friendships where, or just relationships with other people in our life where we got thrown to the curve as soon as we were no longer benefiting that person. And some of us have treated others that way, and some of us have been treated that way. But I want to tell you this, a disposable relationship where you just use that person up and then dump them to the curve is not a Christian relationship. It's not a a Christian thing to do. (laughs) You and I are not called to use people up and abandon them, throw them away. Because guess what? Everybody, the person next to you, the, the, the person that you dislike the most in life, is made in the image of God. And they are valuable to God. If you're going to be like David, having a heart after God, then, then, then you're going to have a heart like God. So you're going to see beyond what annoys you about that person and see that they are made in the image of God and that God values and loves them, so I should value and love them. And we're actually to love them as we love ourselves. You see, the the type of relationship God ultimately calls us into with him and with others is a covenant. See, the world works like a contract. Um, I do my part insofar as you do your part. And should either party not do their part, then the contract is nullified. And that's how we treat people, relationships. And the Bible actually has multiple words for love. We learned agape, God's love. The love that people have is called phileo, which always has a weird word. It sounds like phileo fish. I'm sorry. I'm so I know. I'm sorry. That's just some. I just go on these rabbit trails, and I'm sorry. I can't. I can't stop myself. All right. I have grown in that. Anyway, phileo, which is a human love. It's a love. It, God's love, by definition, needs no reciprocation. Phileo, by definition needs a return. So, you know, how many of you are going to have a successful marriage, you think, if like one of the sp- one spouse does all the work, provides everything, 
does everything and the other person never does anything. Probably not going to be a successful marriage, right? That's a phileo. That needs, in order for me to love you, I need a return from you. You need to do something for me. It's beneficial both ways. But, but God's love is I, I give 100% no matter what you give to me. And that's what a covenant is. So when God makes a covenant, think about it. God never removed his covenant from us. He actually renewed it. He made a new covenant with us. And that's amazing to me. Because none of us, think about the story of God can be summarized like this. God's faithfulness and love to us in spite of our unfaithfulness and rejection of him. Because all of the story of Israel is Israel, God being like, here, I'm going to do this. Get out of Egypt. You're good. And then they start worshiping a a golden cow. It must have been a nice cow. How do you do that? But we look at those stories, we're like, how do they do that? But the reality is God's doing stuff in your life all the time. And and our constant war in our flesh is we always want to take credit for it. Or we don't want to acknowledge God. Or the only time we acknowledge God is when everything's going really wrong. And we're in that moment between the sea and the Egyptian army. And they, we have no way out. And then it's like, okay, God. But I wonder if Israel would have called on God if they had like an airplane right there. You know, just load up, fly out. You see, David... And Jonathan formed this covenant, which means that that, that both sides are going to go all in. And after the moment that David flees, he actually never sees Jonathan again. The last picture Jonathan has of David is an ugly cry. It's not a flattering image. You ever think that later on in Jonathan's life, he thinks of his friend David, and that's what he sees. And as David is going through all, so, so what happens is, from this moment, David flees, and we're going to talk about that next week. But, but eventually what happens is that King Saul and Jonathan, they get killed in a battle. And so this means that David can now sit on the throne, right? And so David, as he's going through the process of consolidating his power and taking over his rule of Israel, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1 He says, is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? So David's search will lead him to a man with a super weird name. And his name will be Mephibosheth. Try to say that three times fast. In fact, that would be a teacher's worst nightmare on the first day of school as you're doing role. Mephibosheth. So I'm going to call him, I'm going to call him Jeff. <laughs> Jeff has been living his life in hiding. <laughs> He's been living his life in hiding. He's Saul's son. I don't know how I can recover from this one, guys. He's been living his life in hiding because, think about it. What happens with, you, you guys watch movies and stuff, I think. But what happens when a new king takes over and there's a rival to the throne out there? What has to happen? The rival has to be disposed of, right? Has to be taken care of. That's how kings consolidate their power. There can't be anybody else with a claim to a king's throne. So so Jeff is out there and he's been living his life in hiding. And he's scared of losing his life as a rival to King David. And when he's brought before David, he bows down, and he actually refers to himself as a dead dog. A dead, he says, I'm a dead dog. In other words, I'm no threat to you. And he expects to receive, at best, life imprisonment, and at worst, death. That's the way of kings. I mean, David himself lived his life on the run from a king who wanted to kill him to to keep his throne. Instead, even though it had been years since David last saw his friend Jonathan, David would respond to this rival to his throne in a similar fashion to how Jonathan responded to David all those years ago. He restores all of the land that had belonged to Saul to Mephibosheth, 
and invites him to always eat at his table. And you notice the covenant between David and Jonathan. It says, our offspring and your offspring will always have, will always have the, be joined together in the name of the Lord. And the invitation to the king's table is an invitation into his family. So Jonathan's son effectively becomes David's son in this moment by sitting at the table of the king. This acts not only a fulfillment of his promise to Jonathan, but a powerful demonstration of what a covenant looks like. It means that no matter what, no matter what we go through, no matter what the distance is or the time, that you and I, our bond in the Lord is stronger than any circumstance or situation. And God has demonstrated that to us time and time again. That no matter how many times we messed up, no matter how far away we got from him, no matter how much we strayed, he was always there ready to renew us and restore our relationship with him. That's what our life is called to look like. In David and Jonathan, we're shown what it means to be a friend to one another. Ultimately, to how to become a godly friend and how to actually invite God into every part of our life. You see, you're, you're going to be on the right track. Not that you're going to get everything right, but you'll be on the right path when you, when you learn to develop a heart like David has, a heart that, that loves God with, all, with everything that you have, heart, soul, mind. And when you start to learn to love others as you love yourself, like Jonathan did. I think David and Jonathan teach us how to keep this commandment of Christ. This commandment that at the end of the day is all about relationship. Our relationship with him and our relationship with each other. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this story and how there's always so many layers that we can get into and that we can see you revealed in every part of it. Dear Lord, I pray today if we're struggling um, and we don't have friends like we see in David and Jonathan, Lord, I pray that, that you would surround anybody in here who feels isolated or lonely, that you would give them friends that are loyal, that are pursuing you, God. Lord, I pray today that we could all be a Jonathan to somebody, that we would lay our things down, that we wouldn't think ourselves more important than others, but we'd be willing to sacrifice and give so that others could be lifted up because that's how we become more like you. And so we thank you and we bless your name in here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.